All right? Brett, I know what you're thinking right now. <laughs> I know what you're all asking yourselves. Maybe I'll... Who is this guy in the picture here? Any ideas? You. No? <laughs> He's an inventor from Sweden. And he created one of the largest business empires in Europe. And he was also the inventor of dynamite. His name is Alfred Nobel. He created a huge business empire and I think you could call him the Mark Zuckerberg of the 19th century. <laughs> but one day in 1888, he changed his life forever. There was one incident and Alfred was in France at that time. And there was a rumor that Alfred Nobel had died in an accident. But what really had happened is that his brother had died, and the French newspapers had confused the two brothers. So when Alfred opened the newspaper in the morning, he read about his own death. I mean, how would you feel if you had to read about your own death in the newspaper? And what was even worse, what they wrote was horrible. The headline went, Le Marchand de Mort est mort. <laughs> the merchant of death is dead. And then they continued and accused him, oh, he had built this huge empire by inventing the dynamite and killing thousands of innocent people, and he was really the merchant of war. And Alfred was really shocked about that because he never intended to kill innocent people or hurt people. He was an inventor, he wanted to help humanity and drive the industrial revolution. So that incident changed his life forever. He decided on that day to do something different with his life and to donate all his fortune. He had $250 million in, in today's money. He decided to donate all this money to a local cause. Today, we do not remember Alfred Nobel as the inventor of dynamite or as the merchant of death. Today we remember Alfred as the inventor of the Nobel Prize. Albert Einstein, Alexander Fleming who invented penicillin, and Winston Churchill. Some of the most outstanding people in the world have received this prize for their contributions to humanity. The interesting thing is that for the first almost hundred years most of the winners of the Nobel Prize were from our continent. They were Europeans. And then suddenly, around the 1970s, that changed and the Americans took over. <laughs> and why did, why did this happen? Why today most innovations in science and technology and also in online gaming why today most of these innovations are originating in the United States and more and more also in Asia. Where do we stand in Europe today in social gaming? So let's look at the, at the three dimensions of the social gaming market. Let's look at the users and the distribution channels, which is mainly social networks, and of course the game developers. I call this a market triangle, <clears throat> and we're going to start with the users, that's the most important one. What do you think, how many people in the world, how many users are playing social games today? Any ideas? According to the latest research studies, it's about 700 million people that play social games today. <coughs> and the same studies propose that it's going to be over a billion in the next five years. The number one country in the world already is China. They have over 150 million players. And it's also a country that's still the fastest growing. The number two country is the United States, with about 110 million players. And their market share is slightly declining, actually, worldwide. Number three country would be Japan, but if you add up all the countries in Europe, then that would be almost as much as the United States. However, of course, 
we all know that Europe is not one country. It's more like a puzzle of several smaller and medium-sized markets. And that has also some implications on strategy. Because if you're from Asia, then you have huge home markets. If you're from China, your home market is 150 million players. So that's why Asian companies focus a lot more on local business. Now, home markets are huge. If you're from Europe, on the other hand, if you're a developer from Sweden or from Poland, then you have rather tiny home markets. And that's why you have to think international right away. You can either localize to all of your languages or you go global and compete internationally on the American market. So 700 million players, how many revenues do these players generate? Let's look at the ARPU. Everybody knows what ARPU is? It's the average revenue per user. And the average revenue per user in social games today worldwide per year is three dollars and the overall revenue generated by those 700 million users is about two billion dollars for this year I have on this chart we have the average revenue per user on the right axis and the number of users on the left axis so we see that our group ranges from $1 in China to $7 in the United States. Let's take the United States as an example, <coughs> the, the blue bubble on the right. So we have about 110 million players. We have an ARPU of about $7 and total revenue for 2011 of $700 million, just social game. So interestingly that in the United States with only 16% of the users, we're generating 42% of the total revenues. That's why the United States is such an important market for all of us today. Interesting is, however, how that picture is going to change in the next years. What we're going to see is that China will get a huge jump in user base, and Japan and also Europe will do a huge jump in our country. The overall revenues are projected to go to 4 billion. That's almost doubling. How are these revenues generated? How does Nike sell their shoes? Or how does McDonald's sell their cheeseburgers? Well, the key to these revenues is, of course, the distribution. And in social games, distribution is highly dependent on social networks. Who of you has seen a map like this? It's like the world map of social networks. So on this map we see um, which network is the dominating social network in what country. The, the dark blue is Facebook, so we can see that Facebook is really dominating the world of social networks today. Well, that's not quite true actually. It's dominating the Western world, and there are some very strong local networks in Asia, like QQ in China and Mixi in Japan. But I'm not going to talk too much about Asia today. I know Benjamin, you will be speaking about that tomorrow. I've seen you talk in San Francisco, so I highly recommend it. Very interesting. The world is almost dominated by Facebook. How is it in Europe? What's the landscape in Europe? Well, Facebook is also the leading social network in Europe. They have about 35% market share here. But what we also see is that Europe is highly fragmented. We have a lot of smaller local social networks like Badu and NetTalk and the Compact and Foxet group here in Germany and also smaller ones in uh, like Hives in the Netherlands or Twenty in Spain. So it's highly fragmented. And many of them are Facebook clones. So their share is actually declining because Facebook is gaining a lot of ground also here in Europe. But so there's a lot of game developers that focus on these local niche networks. So what are the strategies for game developers? Which of you is a game developer? Are there any game developers here? Okay. Anybody from Zynga? <laughs> uh, from Zynga, I guess these guys are too busy counting their Facebook credits to send somebody here. Okay, Zynga is dominating Facebook. This is a chart of the top 10 game developers on Facebook. 
based on their daily active users. So we can see that Zynga is about 62% of the top 10, and um, they are even better in terms of revenue and in terms of profit, because there's not many companies in the social game space that are profitable. But Zynga is a lot profitable. They made, I think, half a billion revenues last year, and their newest game, City will supposedly makes over $30 million profit every month. Well, I guess Alfred Nobel wouldn't be too proud of us here as Europeans because really the Facebook scene is dominated by American companies. There's only three, well actually only two because uh, Flyfish was acquired by Electronic Arts and are American, but there's two companies, uh, Vuga here from Berlin. Is anybody from Vuga here? So, great job. <laughs> And there is a company from Turkey, South Reichland. So only two companies um, in the top ten from Europe. Because competition is very tough on Facebook. Are there any alternative strategies maybe for European developers? Yes, there are. There is the companies that focus on the local networks here in Europe, like Playa from Berlin, or the Russian companies that focus on the Russian networks. And then there's those companies that focus on their own platforms. They put social games on their own websites. Companies like Bigpoint, and also companies like our company, GameDuel, we have social games on our own websites. That is, of course, much more difficult because you need a large user base of Facebook, and you need a lot of traffic. So that strategy is only working for larger companies. So, where do we go from today to tomorrow? We all have to travel on the road of success. And what is the road of success in social games? Anybody here that wears Zara clothing? Like Zara shirts, Zara pants, Zara shoes? <laughs> Zara is the largest textile company in Spain. They were founded in the 1970s in La Coruña and are now, today, one of the most successful fashion retailers in the whole world. They made about $5 billion revenues last year, so that's more than twice as our whole industry together. And Zara are really so successful because they have perfected what they call analytics-driven design and production. So Zara, when they have items Close in the store, they track everything in real time. When a consumer takes the item and buys it, then everything is all the data is analyzed in real time. They know exactly what cuts work the best, what colors work the best, what materials sell. And then they do a lot of split testing in the stores. They, they even test storefront layouts. They have prototypes with different storefront layouts and send users there and split test which works best and which sells best. So they're really deep into the data. And that's their success principle. In the fashion industry, the typical life cycle of products is six months. Zara, they get a new design to the store, selling it in less than four weeks. And when something is not selling within a week and they don't fulfill certain metrics that they have, then they take it off, stop production and test new designs. So Zara has really become the world leader, or one of the world leaders in fashion industry by this analytics driven design. And what Zara has done in the fashion business, Zynga has done in the games business. Zynga call it analytics-driven game design. And I personally believe that that's the, the number one success factor in the social games business. There's many other success factors in making good social games. I've given a talk in London uh, last year about the top 10 success factors in social gaming. And, um, but I'm not going to talk about this, I'm not going to talk about daily spins, I'm not going to talk about uh, how to make viral gifting systems and how to sell limited items and all that. That's all important, but the overall principle, I think, that makes a social game company successful is to have this approach of analytics-driven design. Of course, the problem is if you come up with some great new feature, then Maybe in a week or a couple of weeks later, your competitors will copy that feature. So the whole industry is doing a lot of copying. Zingers themselves are the masters of copying. The question is then, are we all copycats? 
mean, Europe has been accused in particular, there was an article in TechCrunch that European developers are only copying the American models and they, they don't innovate themselves. This is Dieter Ranz, one of my favorite designers in the world. And Dieter Ranz has made some of the most beautiful electronics products in the 1970s and 80s. He was working for a company from Germany called Braun. Very minimalistic design. And here are some of the products that Dieter Ranz has designed. Calculator, radio, loudspeaker system, pocket radio, camera, and television set. That's all from the 1970s and 80s. Interestingly, the, the chief designer of Apple in California, Jonathan Ive, is also a big fan of the Danos. So here's uh, some of the products from Apple. <laughs> so as you again, are we all copy cats? Well, copying or not copying, Analytics driven design on the road to success is our car. With that, we can really go fast. But having a fast car is not enough. To go really fast, you also need a fast road. And the road in the social gaming system, the ecosystem, is made up of three components it's the education and knowledge, it's the venture capital, and the business networking. So where do you think today we have the best roads for social gaming startups in the world? It's not the Deutsche Autobahn. The best roads we have in the Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is the area with the highest concentration of high-tech companies. You have the highest concentration of business angels, good lawyers and venture capitalists. They have invested more than five times the money in the Silicon Valley alone compared to all across Europe together. Silicon Valley is also where you have the, the best or the highest concentration of software developers and product managers and game designers. That's where Zynga is and that's where also where Facebook is. And people say had Mark Zuckerberg not moved from Boston to the Silicon Valley then Facebook would not have been as successful as it is today. There's also a big difference in terms of the attitude towards game designers. If you're a game designer in Europe, I tell people, yeah, I'm, I'm a game designer. They say, okay, so why don't you get a real job? And if you're a game designer in the United States or in Asia, then you're a rock star, right? Then the girls are lining up to date to date you. It's really a completely different picture in Asia. There's also a big difference towards the attitude of of uh, failure in the Silicon Valley, if you're a fa failing as an entrepreneur, then you're a future winner. In, in Europe, if you're failing, then you're a loser. The difference in the culture makes, makes a huge impact on the success of companies. So Europe is still very much focused on finance, and it's very bureaucratic. It takes longer if you start a company, if you enroll a company, there's a lot of stones in your way. And, in the, in the Silicon Valley is more <coughs> entrepreneur friendly and they look much more for the talent. It looks more casual on the surface, you know, like Mark wearing the, the Adi Lab in here. But, um, what it really is, it's more pragmatic, it's faster, and it has a more of a can-do attitude as opposed to you cannot do attitude that we have here in Europe. Our company, Gengo, we have an office here in Berlin, but also in the Silicon Valley. We send people over there to work abroad for a while. That's really important to us because we really get connected to all the people there, talk to the experts, we breathe that spirit of the Silicon Valley that has helped us to compete on a global level. There's also a whole different level of networking in the United States. This picture was taken at a recent dinner at the White House where President Obama invited the top people from the Silicon Valley for a networking event. 
On its right is Mark Zuckerberg, and on the left is Steve Jobs from Apple, and behind there is the CEOs of Twitter and Yahoo. There's also the president of Stanford University, and you have a couple of top venture capital guys, and Eric Schmidt from Google. Interesting, Stanford University, I was quite surprised to learn that the annual budget of Stanford University is $3.8 billion. That is 10 times more the major universities here in, in Europe have. And if you calculate it on a per student basis, it's more than 100 times the, the money. Do we get the same top executive attention here in Europe from our leaders like they get it here in the States? I think not yet. Not yet for the internet business. But the good news is Berlin is also moving. That's what we feel. We're doing much more from the bottom up here in Berlin. We're doing more grassroots <laughs> approach. For example, our company gave up we do a quarterly networking event called Berlin 2.0, where we invite the top entrepreneurs from the Berlin internet scene and from Germany to, to come here for an exclusive networking dinner. We also do a regular event series called Tech Talk, where we invite people from the technology sector, uh, like we had um, the CTO of Amazon, Werner Vogels, recently here, who was giving a talk about cloud computing. <laughs> and these uh, events are not just for our own company, we, we do them openly so everybody can come and join. We see a lot of things happening right now in the last two years here in Berlin. I read on Monday, TechCrunch, they wrote that I felt that Berlin really has the vibe of becoming the Silicon Valley of Europe. So I'm really happy to see that. So we're moving on the road to success here in Berlin. Let's talk about our future. What is the future in social gaming? I mean, I'm not a fortune teller, so I can't tell you exactly about the future. No one can do that. But what I want to do is I want to share with you five major trends, five game changers that I see are happening in our industry in the next month, in the next year, that will have a big impact on our business. And the first one is the secret. So the first one, have you heard about the, the game of life? Well, the social graph, everybody knows the social graph. Social graph is, you see it on Facebook, what, what people eat, what their friends are doing, what they party, if they're single, if they're in a relationship. I mean, Facebook even knows if I break up with my girlfriend, then Facebook knows it earlier than my girlfriend. Uh, so all that data around your friends and what they're doing, that's the social graph. And the social graph is owned by Facebook. It's worth several billion dollars, it's their most valuable asset. And just like there is a social graph, there's also the game of graph. The game of graph is all the data around the games, like your high scores, who you played against, who you beat, who you won, your, what awards you won in the games. Is that any valuable information? Well, let me ask you this. Why is Apple building the game center? Because that's about the game of graph. Why is Google doing the same thing? Why did a Japanese company agree buy OpenFame for $104 million? And OpenFame was working on the game of graph. It's because the game of graph is valuable. Who controls the game of graph controls distribution. And we're seeing a lot of more companies now working on these game data, on this game metadata right now. So that's one of the trends that we see for the future. The second game changer. It's going to happen in 37 days. Do you know what's happening in 37 days? Anybody? Facebook credits. Facebook credits, exactly. It's the 1st of July, 37 days from now. And Facebook credits will become the only currency on Facebook. So what we're seeing is a lot of disruptions in the monetization infrastructure, in social networks. It has happened already last year where Facebook policy changes and some companies went out of business overnight 
and some others only barely survived by changing their business model 180 degrees. So we're seeing a lot of disruption happening. Facebook credits is happening on 1st of July. I don't need to talk about that. You all know about, about this. And there's other things in the monetization infrastructure that are changing. Um, I'm sure the guys from SponsorPay and TriPay would love to talk about video ads, what's happening in that space. In the last month, this has been exploding. It's, it's crazy. But that will have an impact on monetization. And another thing happening there is meta currencies. It's really like a war of currencies going on. Why do you think Zynga has created Zcoin's currency? It's like a currency across all their games where they lock in the users. If you control the currency, then you control the users. If you control the currency, you run all the games. That's why our prediction is that more and more companies in the space will be creating their own meta currencies. Game changer number three is an evolution of cross market. What do you think is more important today? Having a great quality game or having millions of users in your network? I think it's happening. In the future, distribution will be more important than content. Because if you have an awesome game, but you don't have access to the users, then you're not going to be as successful. That's why the companies that already have a large user base are in a huge advantage. They can leverage that and do a lot of cross-promotion, cross-marketing. Here's an example from Sega and Frontier World, where you had to do a quest in Frontier World to get this knife from Mafia Wars. So it's cross-app promotion, cross-app questing. And that's working really well. So everything is now cross, 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 app, cross, company, cross platform. There's services like Amplifier, if you're not so huge, you can use them to promote your games in other games and vice versa. So if you're not one of the top largest companies, then you should talk to your neighbors, talk to the other companies and do cross marketing. Because that's the way you can lock in the users then and, and get access to traffic. Trend number four is moving off the social networks. Two years ago, when social gaming came up, everybody thought, okay, social games are games played on social networks, right? Today we know that that's not really the definition of social game. So social games are more about social gameplay, that's what makes them social, and not necessarily on social networks. So we see more and more companies putting social games outside of Facebook, outside of social networks. Ever heard of Good Game Studios? They're a company from Hamburg in Germany. They have over 100 people. They're profitable. They have a lot of games outside social networks. Or Spielwiese, which is a new project from the guy from the Ballisten, where they put all these social games on their own platform. This one probably you've heard, Famarama from, from Big Point. Anybody here from Big Point? Okay, great job, Famarama. I heard they may they have 700,000 concurrent users playing that game. That's not 700,000 DAU. That's 700 people at the same time playing that game on their own platform. It's monetized very well. So we see more and more social games outside of social networks. The biggest game changer that's happening right now in social games. And the rest smiling. <laughs> That's mobile social gaming. More and more social gaming will be happening not on your computers but here on these smartphones, on the iPhone, on Android, on all the other platforms. Facebook already has 91 million daily active users using Facebook on iPhone and the other devices. And they say that the largest part of their traffic in the future will be mobile. If you look at the Asian networks, which are typically three to five years ahead, there is already like a mix here. They have 85% of their traffic is already mobile. There's a lot of things happening in the mobile space. Like Mobagi is um, from, from Dina, it's a network in, in Japan. And the company behind it, DNA, they have over a billion in revenues 
every year, and they're traded on the stock market. Their company is worth $5.4 billion. All these companies are now coming to Europe and to the West, to the United States. They're going shopping, they're acquiring companies in the space, they're invading our space. So we have to watch out what's happening there. We have these five game changers happening. Rise of the game of graph, disruptions in the monetization infrastructure, evolution of cross-marketing, companies are moving their games off the social networks, and mobile social gaming is growing like crazy. If you put all that together, what does that mean for our future? Well, users can access social games from desktop computers and mobile devices. And the distribution is controlled by the big portals, by social networks, and by companies that have their own sites. In the past, all these were six different separate segments. There were some companies that were dominating one segment, or maybe two segments, but it was all separated. In the future, this will all be one world. It will all be connected by the gamograph, by meta currencies, and by cross-marketing. In the future, if you're only in one channel, then you're in trouble. If your competitor has access to several channels, then you can acquire users for a lower acquisition cost than you can. If your competitor is on several channels, then you can monetize the users in different channels and get higher RP than you can. So you have to go across the channels. You have to break down the walls. The good thing is, right now there are some companies dominating these segments, but there's no company yet that is the leader of the cross-platform game. So maybe it's going to be a year. We think the race is on. The race for the cross-platform game. Alright, I'm not Alfred Nobel, and I didn't invent the dynamite. I'm probably never going to win a Nobel Prize. But let's suppose there was a Nobel Prize for social games. Who would win the Nobel Prize in social gaming? Would it be an American? Or would it be somebody from Asia? Or a European? Somebody from Silicon Valley? Or from Beijing? Or from Berlin? Well, I don't know. And I don't really care because I think this is not about countries or nationalities or Europe versus some American or Asians. I think this is about making great experiences for the user and creating innovation. And this is exactly the spirit that Alfred Nobel had when he invented the Nobel Prize. When he invented the Nobel Prize 120 years ago, he said, in awarding the prizes, no consideration shall be given to the nationality of the candidates, whether they're from Europe or whether they're from America or from Asia. There shall only be one criteria. It is the most worthy that shall receive the prize. The most worthy. Most worthy.